Hey everyone, Dave here, and right now I'm geeking out over the fact that we're in the future! Dave's Obsession! Dave's Obsession of the Homo Moment! That's right, buttheads! Dry your jackets and pull out your pants pockets because we are finally actually approaching the actual date that Marty McFly arrived in the future. Unless you're watching this on YouTube, in which case we just past that date, as well as the 60th anniversary of the discovery of time travel, but we are rapidly approaching the 60th anniversary of the Hill Valley lightning storm. But if you're watching this video on its original Geek Vision release date, then Marty and Doc's arrival is imminent, which will hopefully put a stop to all those fake dates that keep going viral for increasingly stupid reasons. And it hopefully means that California is getting some rain soon. And what better way to celebrate our favorite non-British, non-surfer dude, non-canine time-traveling duo's arrival than with a look back at the movie that gave us our first glimpse in October 2015, Back to the Future Part 2, a movie I adore with all my heart. Now, of course, it's silly to call an entry in one of the most successful and enduring trilogies of all time underrated, but I do think Back to the Future Part 2 is underappreciated as a sequel. Because Back to the Future Part 2 might be one of the first ever sequels about sequels. And it might still be one of the funniest. With all due respect to 22 Jump Street, of course. Do the same thing as last time. Everyone's happy. In the same way that much of the plot of 22 Jump Street is the people in charge want us to redo the first movie, much of the plot of Back to the Future Part 2 is literally we need to go back to the first movie. It's a Back to the Future sequel all about people's expectations for a Back to the Future sequel, where the characters go back to revisit all the classic scenes from the first film, just like people think they want sequels to do. But Dave, why are you calling this a self-aware homage to repetitive sequelitis instead of just a victim of repetitive sequelitis? Well, I admit it can be a fine line. But self-awareness has always been part of Back to the Future's DNA. The first movie had fun playing with the tropes of all sorts of genres, from sci-fi to romantic comedies, and the second movie picks up right where it left off. Such as this classic scene. When are you gonna get it through your thick skull, Lorraine? You're my girl. If Tannen, I wouldn't be your girl even if, even if you had a million dollars. Everything about this scene, from the dialogue to the performances to the camera work, treats it like it's the ominous setup to a later payoff. You know, the sort of thing Edgar Wright likes doing in the first act of his films. I have a bloody merry first thing. Or a bite of the king's head, a couple of the little princess. We'll stagger back him. <laughs> Back at the bar for Sean's. It's just that in this case, it's an hour into the movie, and it's foreshadowing something that we already saw happen. I'm gonna marry you someday, Lorraine! Someday you'll be my wife! Of course, earlier on, there was some actual thematic foreshadowing, uh, actually involving the playing with the tropes, when the movie gives us the most meta joke in the entire trilogy. Excuse the disguise, Marty, but I was afraid you wouldn't recognize me. I went to a rejuvenation clinic and got a whole natural overhaul. They took out some wrinkles, did a hair repair, change of blood, added a good 30 to 40 years to my life. They also replaced my skin and colon. What do you think? You look great, Doc. Now, the practical reason this bit is here is so that they wouldn't have to put older Doc makeup on Chris Lloyd for every single scene in the movie. But Marty's reaction shows that he barely even notices a difference. And truth be told, it took me years before I even noticed that Doc was wearing old age makeup in the 1985 scenes in the first movie. It's a gag born out of necessity, and yet the entire joke here is acknowledging that the audience didn't even realize it was necessary. And that sentence is still one of the least confusing things about this movie. That scene foreshadows the fact that this movie is going to be about itself on some level, and it's soon followed by another scene that foreshadows the movie's take on sequelitis by evoking and then subverting an iconic scene from the first movie. Look, I need to borrow your hoverboard. And yes, a lame, unimaginative sequel would also revel in redoing scenes from the first movie, but what separates this from a dull, boring, repetitive sequel is that only the surface level details are repeated. Yes, at a very casual glance, the hoverboard chase is a retread of the skateboard chase from the first movie, but the scene plays out completely differently. In the first movie, the skateboard chase is a swashbuckling hijink where Marty is at an advantage because he's the only one who knows how a skateboard works, because he's the one from the future. He has the element of surprise, and Biff and the gang have no idea what to do with him, other than try to outmuscle him, which does not work so well for them. Yeah! 
In the second movie, the cocky young Marty goes into the hoverboard chase thinking he has the same advantage, but he's the only one who doesn't know how hoverboards work because he's the one not from the future. Unless you've got power! And the differences are cemented with the kids' reactions to the proceedings. 50s kid may be impressed with his new skateboard, but a Mattel hoverboard is not cooler than a pit bull. Biff may find something very familiar about all this, but Really, the only thing that's the same about the scenes are the music and the setup where Marty rips the handlebars off of something to escape a Tannen gang. Of course, if Marty came to the real 2015, he'd rip the handlebars off a Segway and make... whatever that is. And that scene is no fluke. Nearly every time something from the first movie is repeated, the second movie ups the stake and changes the context. Very little is repeated for the sake of repetition, unless that repetition is there to set up a later subversion. This isn't some Shanghai Nights where they just redo the same scenes from the first movie in an attempt to get the same laugh as the first movie. When 1985 Biff tells Marty, say hi to your mom for me, he's exerting his dominance over the McFlies. But when 2015 Biff tells Marty Jr., say hi to your grandma for me, he's impotently trying to tease the McFlies despite being stuck in the distant past. The Johnny B. Good scene is a victory lap in the first movie. Here it's still a tense race where one wrong move on the second Marty's part could spell disaster. Conversely, Doc's high wire act on the clock tower is a victory lap in this movie. George punching Biff is a conflict resolution in both movies, but the same punch serves as two very different solutions to two very different problems. Even something as simple as the song Mr. Sandman is used to show Marty's discomfort in the 50s in the first movie and his familiarity with the 50s in the second one. The closest the scene comes to merely serving a repeated function is Leah Thompson waking up Marty, which at least also serves as the second entry in a rule of three gag. I guess the manure also serves a similar function as it did in the first movie, but the joke has escalated because he just got done cleaning that damn car. Oh, Biff, you rapscallion. I hate the door! Okay, so Back to the Future 2 might not be a straight-up parody of sequels the way 22 Jump Street is, but it's still a movie that has a blast taking the expectations of sequels to their most literal manifestations, and then experimenting with how to twist them around. It's a movie where changing things too much from the first movie is disastrous, but sticking too close to the first movie is also dangerous, allowing it to have its Pepsi perfect and drink it too. It's a movie that delights in its own self-indulgence and its own self-subversion almost as much as it delights in its own self-convolution. It's also the movie that has the most fun with time travel itself. I mean, it's the only film in the trilogy where going back in time is actually a solution to a problem rather than the cause of all the problems. And it's also the first movie where we really get a good arc for Marty. I mean, Marty had a bit of an arc in the first movie where he's on his way to mail his record to a record company or however that worked in the 80s, but the first movie was really George's arc, and the second movie sets up Marty's arc, which is completed in part three, and it's actually an interesting reversal of George's arc, where George's arc is solved through confrontation, but okay, I'm getting sidetracked. I could talk about these movies for hours, and I'm sure I will. No doubt in the future you'll see several more videos from me about this trilogy. There's a lot to discuss here. People have been discussing these movies for the past 30 years, and we're still discovering new things about them. Of course, not everyone who discusses the movies enjoys them as much as I do, which is fine, you know, everybody has their own taste. But over my years of discussing this trilogy, I keep hearing people bring up flaws with it that aren't actually flaws, and in fact are kind of stupid. And we're going to be discussing some of those next time. Until then, this is Dave, signing off.